My name is Musa Adnan, that's Mufti Mank. This is Rewritted, and here's what we have coming up today. If I see people in the da'wah or in, in anything, I will encourage them to the degree that I will purposely make them feel like they are superheroes and superstars. The reason is, they are the future leaders, it's not me. I'm here temporary, I mean I've already clocked mid-40s, I'm about to clock 50 inshallah. And to be very honest with you, uh, you know, the, the, w- we're past our sell-by date. The fact that you're a Muslim and you identify as a Muslim, just the way you move will inspire people to want to know more about Islam. Habibi, I believe that one of the first steps is the haters who hate Islam. You know, to minimize that hatred is a great success in da'wah because the ultimate guidance of shahada comes from Allah. Innaka la tahdi man ahbabta. And this is one of the things that I have actually developed over time. Uh, when it comes to da'wah, when it comes to the field, non-judgmental, completely. You never know what's going to happen. I've seen miracles. Brother Musa, we were talking about someone who was a belly dancer. And you know what? This person actually bought a ticket to one of the events, came in to say the shahada. And... If my father didn't take me out of school, I, w- I wouldn't be sitting here. I don't think I'd be sitting here. Can I tell you one thing? Uh, a piece of advice for all those who are going through blocked uh, you know, passages and closed doors. Please. Try your best within the capacity given to you by Allah. If it is still closed, set yourself a little deadline and move on. You have to close the door. You know, you talk about marrying people. Uh, you know, uh, at some stage we all have had people who we wanted to marry and we were blocked. If I were to tell you that I was blocked too. At a certain stage where the father told me you can go to hell. And I, I, I literally went to heaven as a result. <laughs> <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allahu akbar. Uh, some people, you know, they might think it's Photoshop or it's uh, After Effects on one of these programs. We have Mufti Mank in the studio. Allahu <laughs> akbar. Bless us all and grant us. I mean, Jazakallah khair Mufti for taking time out of your busy schedule to come down and speak to us here on Rerouted today. Jazakallah khair for making the time to have me on the show. Mashallah. Ma, always. It's, it's, it's a pleasure of mine. Alhamdulillah. We've known you for some time now. Mashallah. And it's been an absolute pleasure, you know, getting to know you. Uh, we've done some of the Light Upon Light tours as well. And it's been it's been amazing. And we can get into the work a little bit later on as well, inshallah. But I want to start off this podcast on a little bit of a light note. Okay. So we, we, we're going to do something. For some of our special episodes, what we're going to try and do is something different. Okay. So I want to start off, if you're okay, with some quick fire questions. Okay. I'm not too good at it, but let's go for it. Okay, I don't so mind. The I'm people can quickly, very, very quickly see, you know, what happens in the life of Mufti Mank. Bismillah. Bismillah. Okay. Bismillah. The first one, Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe or UK? Zimbabwe. Biryani or Mandi? Mandi. Mandi. That, that's what I would say as well. Car or motorbike? Motorbike. Allahu Akbar. Android or Apple? Android. Subhanallah. Shocking. What is your actual name? Ismail Musa Mink. Allahu Akbar. Favorite place? Nigeria. Coffee or tea? Tea. Favorite food? I don't have. Actually, that's facts. You don't. You don't have a favorite. I don't food. have a favorite food. Okay. Mecca or Medina? Medina. Al Bake or KFC? Al Bake. Yes. Pizza Hut or Domino's? Domino's. Thin crust. Yes. Okay. Shocking. Cricket, Pakistan or India? Uh, all the Muslims. Okay. Samosa or Vakora? Neither. Favorite ayah in the Quran right now? Wala sawfa yu'atika rabbuka fatarda. How far back can you name your ancestors? Eight generations. Allahu Akbar. Which scholar from the past inspires you the most? Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. I guess that comes to the next one, which is favorite companion. Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. And why? Uh, tons of reasons. I think he was the hero. He he stood with the Prophet ﷺ from the very beginning. Not to say there were not other heroes, but uh, the sacrifice, uh, a lot of what he's done inspires me, actually. Hmm. And I think we're nowhere near that. But subhanAllah, I always try to... I even tell people who say we've named our, our kid after you, uh, not to do that because I say actually the heroes are others, they're not me, you know. So there is a lot, it's a topic on its own. Uh, he really has done a lot. He's, 
I don't know, he, he, and he's not the only one, but like he's the top of the list. Subhanallah. Mm. That's my belief. He's wow. the best to tread the earth after the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that's it. His name was Abdullah ibn Uthman. Yeah. It's interesting because when a lot of people speak about scholars from the past, it's rare that they actually talk about the companions. Yeah, I think those were the scholars actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah most definitely. Subhanallah. Favorite reciter? Uh... I can't tell you. Okay. Uh, there, there is one, but I won't say his name. Okay. Favorite book? The Quran, definitely. And uh, yeah, if, uh, other books. marjan fi alayhi shaykhan. That's a book of hadith. It has in it a compilation of all the ahadith that are muttafaq alayhi. That's it. Okay. Allahu Akbar. Most amazing new country that you went to? So mm. maybe like a new country you went to recently? Uh... Uh, every country has its own piece of, uh, you know, uniqueness. And I really love uh, all countries that I've been to. There's always something special about them. And that's Allah's way of, um, I think, opening our eyes to say mm. every country has positives and negatives. It's up to us what we make of all of that. Yeah. So like I told you, Nigeria is my favorite place for many reasons and, and West Africa at large. Mm. But at the same time, uh, it, it, it's not from a, an infrastructural perspective. It's from many other angles. But Alhamdulillah, the countries are good. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. Um, the favorite, f- your favorite form of exercise? Swimming. Swimming. Yeah. That's what I would say mine is as well. Even though I don't get to do it a lot, you know, over here. Yeah, we're in the same boat. The swimming gyms are very, very expensive. You know, may Allah make yeah. it easy for us. Mashallah. Uh, <laughs> uh, morning person or night person? Night person. Okay, interesting. I wasn't expecting that one. Uh, your favorite product to use, um, whether it be like an oil or like a cream or... Uh, Moroccan argan. Moroccan argan oil. I thought you were going to say that. I thought you were going to oh say that. You can see the beard shining. Yeah, no, because once okay. when we when we done Light Upon Light, I asked you, I said, Mufti, what did you put in your beard? Because it was it, had, it looked like it had diamonds in it. And you, you told me it was argan oil. Moroccan argan, uh, there are two types. One is the one to eat and the one to apply. Yeah. Yeah, you, you just need a good original one that is scentless, meaning it's the original argan smell. Yeah. Allahu Akbar. Yeah. Jazakumullah khairan. Okay, so that's the quick fire done. That's, if there was any pressure, it's gone. Uh, I, thought, I thought we were just getting started. Yeah, no, no, Mashallah. that's it. SubhanAllah. I was trying to think of questions, new ones, yeah. the no, brothers. They were, very, they were very good questions. Jazakumullah khair. Thank you so much. My favorite one um, is the biryani and mandi one. Oh, you're okay, yeah. Actually, <laughs> biryani, I don't eat, uh, I don't like spicy food. I, I cannot eat spicy food. Yeah. Uh, that's the reason why mandi, as much as it might be sl- tasteless compared to biryani, but if the biryani is my mother's, then uh, then I'll eat it. And if it's my wife's, I'll love it, mashallah. Allahu Akbar. I think there's a lot of hikmah in that, right? So there's, <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of mashallah. <laughs> I'm learning from you, Mufti. I'm learning from you. I mean, what yakum. So, with me, I really, really like. Um, I'm not going to make. By the way, some people may be thinking, "Is he going to make this all about food?" It's not going to all be about food. Uh, I, I prefer mandi myself as well. I think it's just the way that the Arabs they cook rice and meat. It's just. Yeah, I can tell you something interesting. I'm not a food person. Like food okay. is not a priority in my life. Uh, okay. Luxury is not a priority in my life either. Mm. Mm. Um, I, 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 I've been eating once a day for a long, long time. Uh, and subhanAllah, I can eat almost anything. And that's why when I say I don't have a favorite food, I'm not lying to you. I, mm. I appreciate a lot. And I'm not a person who will run after food. But if I go to Makkah, Medina, oh, the I'll bake, I've got to try it out once, like once in the journey. You know, mm-hmm. It's just like, uh, it's not a sunnah, by the way, but it's just something, you know. It's it's kind of like an unwritten rule, you know. If you From go, back in the day. Yeah, if you go to Makkah or Medina and you don't have al Bayk, I think it's going to be very questionable. Alhamdulillah, I actually had the privilege of doing Hajj this year. Mashallah. For the first time. And it was, an, it was a beautiful experience. And I remember at Mina, when we were there, they had an al Bayk there. Yeah, yeah. So that helped us get through things, Alhamdulillah. So, alhamdulillah. alhamdulillah. So getting to the actual topic, Mufti, Bismillah. today, I want to speak about yourself. Okay. I think that many of the people watching, all of us, yes. we've all benefited from your reminders. May Allah bless every one of us. I mean, accept it. I mean, I mean, and may Allah allow you and increase you in doing uh, the amazing work that you do. Amen. I think that many, many people have benefited, and the numbers are testament to that. And the people that you know speak about how they've benefited you, uh, from you are a testament to that. So I wanted to kind of learn more about the person. As, as a personality, you yes. know, Mufti Menk. What is Mufti okay. Menk about? What's behind the name? What's behind the stage? What's behind, you know, the Instagram? What's, what's behind all of this? Yeah. 
what are your interests your personal goals how was your upbringing how did you find life you know you speak about many struggles you know if if you were to just write on youtube you speak about many problems that people go through why do you choose to speak about certain things and maybe you know focus on them more is it because yes. maybe you went through them yourself earlier on prior in life and you felt like this is something that really really helped you and you want to help other people through it so we want to kind of dig into that inshallah the first question i would have mufti is how was your upbringing I, I, you grew up in zimbabwe right yes how how was life in zimbabwe growing up there? i'm sure a lot of people have pre pre understandings of africa and the way it is and maybe even zimbabwe how would you describe your upbringing i think it was very simple i was born in the compound of a masjid which means that's where my parents were living when i was born a compound of a masjid my father was an imam and he's a he's a scholar in his own right he's done a lot of good work uh, in zimbabwe and uh, it was a very simple hand to mouth sort of upbringing i don't come from a wealthy background like we mm. uh, alhamdulillah it's not like we you know we didn't have food and that but uh we you know we were like limited budget of a family so to speak and this was in the early stages i yeah. went to a government school which was uh obviously zimbabwe being colonized by the british yeah. the schools were very british okay and that's the reason why even the english that we speak in zimbabwe is not too far off from british english yeah sure uh, sometimes some of the zimbabweans actually have better english than those here hmm. So subhanallah it's just uh it was simple and uh I was always uh, brought up in a religious home with the deen with salah with uh, ibada I never had a girlfriend in my life I have mm. never never been to a cinema never wow. been to a nightclub wow. uh never touched a cigarette wow. never had uh, f- uh, you know drugs was something that was not even in the picture Uh, I've had a very very clean upbringing alhamdulillah and I thank Allah for that my life was mostly with the Quran uh mostly with uh, learning and uh, I used to do both school secular as well as uh, uh, uh doing hifz and then learning the books and at the same time I used to go to one of the Arab embassies when I was very very young to learn Arabic so I learned it at the age of 4 5 and 6 mm-hmm. the Arabic language and uh, all the embassy st- staffs kids used to learn there and i was put into there by my dad uh after that i completed hifz and i was learning uh, i learned a little bit of the other languages you know i learned urdu gujarati uh quite a few other languages and then i progressed through primary school i was a top student most of the time first second or third in the class allah uh, i don't i can't remember seeing fourth position and i'm just saying this wow. so that people know and i was always a very uh, ambitious person uh, as much as i loved the deen and i knew i was a hafiz and i knew that i could mimic very easily i could actually imitate a lot of the imams of the haram at the time abdullah al khalifi rahmatullahi alayhi muhammad al sabayl that was a generation when i was young wow. and uh i've never heard of these people yeah subhanallah, subhanallah. yeah th- those were the guys uh mm. abdullah khayyat is the father of usama khayyat he had beautiful uh, re- recitation at the uh, way back um and then uh, i remember i was very glued onto my radio at that time that was the technology i used to listen to world news all the time bbc i even know some of the names of some of the presenters at the time some of them are still there and mm. uh, it was amazing i used to keep up uh, with whatever's happening across the globe and um even the local news uh, i used to keep up i used to very few friends uh, i used to uh, i started playing sport not because i loved it but because the school the high school i went to was actually a private college uh, a private christian college yeah. and uh, it was probably probably at the time the best if not one of the best in the country and still is uh we had to play rugby basketball hockey uh, mm. s- you know tennis uh cricket swimming i did i did it all so i've had that and then as i grew older i wanted to become um uh, an ophthalmologist and i was really looking forward to that and allah had it such that i ended up pursuing uh, sharia in medina munawwara so this was all part of the plan of allah nice. and i thank allah for this but the upbringing was pretty simple we we you know uh, we used to get a pair of new clothes a year i think and uh, hand me downs most of the time from our older mm-hmm. brothers and uh, the shoes as well we used to buy a pair for eid every year one one pair um it was it was a pretty simple life and as life progressed alhamdulillah things became much easier uh alhamdulillah you know we're quite a big family of nine 
uh, from us. There are some in the da'wah and some in business, and those in business support those in the da'wah. So many people say, you know, where does Mufti Mink get his money from and so on. I'm not sponsored by anyone. I don't have, I'm not affiliated to anyone. I yeah. don't get money from any government, any organizations. I don't get money from, I don't raise money from the public for myself. I don't do any of that. A lot of it is just uh, within our own family, uh, the system and the structure. So a lot of people are quite uh, excited about, you know, how, how come he's, you know what? Alhamdulillah, we have a, a position where the da'wah that we do is more so, uh, we do have a lot of well wishes right now, but more so sponsored within a very close circle of people, very close. So there's no foreign government involved, no foreign people involved, nothing. Actually, uh, very few. If you've ever seen me, have I ever asked for money for donations for my organization? Oh, never. Yet it's a massive organization. Mm -hmm. Over the years, we've built 52 masjids and madrasas. We've actually, uh, we, we have right now more than 2,000 students in total. Wow. Uh, from those, about 1,000 are full-time. And uh, subhanAllah, these are all underprivileged people who don't pay a fee. So everything is taken care of. It's all happening within Zimbabwe. Amazing. Uh, all underprivileged people who are empowered, and that's what we believe. I personally find that very, very inspiring. Um, I mean, knowing knowing yourself, Mufti, one of the things that I've seen is exactly what you mentioned, how, um, how it becomes a thing where people, you know when you have like someone who's like a popular speaker? Yes. And the more popular the speaker is, people they have this like you know this understanding from before which is if i'm going to book this speaker i'm going to pay thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds yes to bring him over yes he what it's like expected i need yeah. to give him a five-star hotel i need to do all of this okay. but one thing i've seen with you mashallah tabarakallah and may allah preserve you in this is that you don't take from the table you bring to the table that's true yeah i've actually sponsored events myself yeah. in some places yeah. i've actually uh, Alhamdulillah, I'm, I'm not saying this in order to uh, brag, but I'm yeah, saying yeah. it just to clear the air. Yeah, it's important. And I, I thank Allah for giving me this opportunity. Uh, to be very fair, uh, mostly, if someone were to invite you, you'd expect, uh, you know, transport and accommodation to be covered yeah, by them. Yeah, you should expect but that, yeah. But if it is a very good cause and those people cannot afford that, then I'll study the matter. And if I feel that I need to uh, cough it up myself, I would do, and I have done. And sometimes if, if uh, the cause itself, someone plans a conference and so on and they can't, uh, they, they can't really, uh, you know, fulfill the financial obligations, I might find out how much it costs and, you know, I'll just tell them, okay, we've got someone to give it to you. But in actual fact, it, uh, my money needs to be used as well in, in, in a good cause. You Most know? definitely, yeah, yeah, yeah. So at times and, uh, yeah. you know, if I feel it's necessary and it's going to be very beneficial. Inshallah. Most definitely. Inshallah. Like I came to you today, I think you might have noticed it's my own car. I hired it myself. I yeah. came to you on my own. I, I don't like to have an entourage of people because I believe that that's, uh, you know, the, 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 the people of today don't want to see a guy walking with a whole entourage. You know, you are yourself. You need to move uh, as a person. I'd like to go to my events on my own. I'd like to do my thing myself and walk out immediately if I can. I mean, I've said it to people that I know that um, I'm... I, uh, you know, w when you're trying to get in touch with someone, I've expressed it to people, like friends to me, like that, subhanAllah, this brother, he's got like, you have to go through like five people before you go to him. I've got Mufti Menk on my phone. I can just message him and speak to him directly. Yeah, I'm sorry and if I haven't answered you almost immediately. No, 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 no. Yeah. It's 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 just it, you do. Alhamdulillah, yeah. you do, you do. Sometimes I, I just want to make it quite clear: there are people who do message me. They don't introduce themselves, and, so, and I don't have their numbers saved on my phone, and I won't respond those because I don't know who they are yeah, yeah. Uh, for security purposes. Of course, of yeah. course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, th I think all of us, when you when you kind of get involved in the dawah and stuff like that, and you start to get a little bit of a following, I think it's important to take those precautions um just generally speaking but yeah this is one thing that i've seen from you mufti which is uh that you're, you're very very focused on the dawah so i want to find out how you got here so your time in medina how would you describe your time that you spent in medina how, how long were you there approximately for about s just over six years okay and yeah. what kind of things did you get up to while you were in medina other than obviously studying at the university and well actually we used to have uh a group of people uh, we used to get together once in a while, Zimbabweans, and uh, okay. you know, study matters back at home and see how things are. And mm -hmm. I think uh, when I was a student between 1991 and 90, 1991 and 1998, 
uh, I think what happened is at that time, you know, things were still calm. You know, people there was not this labeling and all of that. If you asked me what a madkhali was at the time, I wouldn't even know. Uh, because I was even, you know, to be honest with you, I, it was something, uh, I'm just being brutally honest, you know. Uh, if you asked me uh, so many other things, yeah, we, they weren't even an issue at the time. We were really s- concerned about expanding, learning, understanding. Uh, you know, one of my favorites is Sheikh Abdul Mashal Abbad. To this day, I have a, a good, uh, you know, uh, rapport. And uh, there are other mashayikh as well. And, you know, people try and label you based on who's the sheikh. And that's the reason why I always say, uh, you know, try to go back to qalallahu wa qala rasul in, the, in reality. When, I, when you call out to people, when you're calling people towards Allah, and if you were to quote your sheikhs, whatever sect you belong to, you're already discouraging people because they want to hear what Allah and his rasul have said. I'm not saying it's wrong. You know, people might say, oh, well, you know, you've got to quote your sheikh. But, you know, to be very fair, who are you calling? Are you preaching to the preached? Or would you like to preach to people who perhaps you feel need a little bit of of love, care and tapping before they would actually understand what uh, the deen is all about? So there is a lot. There is a lot of wisdom. There is a lot of thought that goes into what happens. Uh, and sometimes uh, some people might not understand your approach, but that doesn't make you wrong. It might make them a little bit a lacking in understanding of something that's required in, in, in the ummah. That's quite deep. You know, I might come across quite young, but to be honest, I've been in the field mo- more than a lot of the guys out there today. Yeah, most definitely. Yeah. Most definitely. So, w- with Medina University, you're there for six years. Yes. Um, I think a lot of people, they, it's like a dream of this, you know, to go and live in Medina. Yes. And uh, you're in the Prophet's Masjid, you're spending time there, and it, it's a beautiful experience. Do you feel like that experience, that period of your life, really shaped the person that you are today? That six years? Uh, to a great degree. I mean, obviously, I, I've sat in the lessons of Sheikh Ibn Baz, rahmatullahi alayhi. Wow. I've met them. I've met him. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sheikh Ibn Uthaymin, rahmatullahi alayhi. Wow. I've sat in his lessons. I've met him too. Uh, a lot of the other mashayikh who've, who've passed on as well. Uh, mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, like I said at the time, people didn't make a big deal out of things. Just today, people say, oh, you start. And you know what? I've heard, I've asked, I've benefited. And uh, mm-hmm. unfortunately, what I've noticed now is sometimes people don't realize uh, that they have actually uh, taken this to a level of labeling to the degree that I think if those sheikhs were there themselves today, mm-hmm. they probably would have disassociated from those who are quoting them at times, at mm-hmm. times, not saying all the time, but it's just a matter of understanding. Yes. So, yes, that did shape a lot of uh, the understanding. But to be honest with you, I was very, very fortunate, very, very fortunate to have seen many different scenarios. You know, the background I come from uh, and and uh, then going to Medina and after that going to learn Urdu in, 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 in India. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people say, uh, you know, why did you go there and where did you go there and, and so on. <laughs> You know yeah. what, uh, I, I went there and I think I, I, today I can speak Urdu in, 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 in a beautiful way. I think uh, people don't realize that and I learned a lot and I was, I was, uh, I benefited by learning the Hanafi fiqh because the, the community I live in is predominantly Hanafi and Shafi'i. So mm-hmm. it was very, very interesting and really uh, it taught me something. I can give you a very quick be- point of benefit. You know, when I studied in Medina, uh, yes, there's a lot of ilm and so on, but they, uh, there is very little to do with your discipline that the jami'a or the university would actually take uh, okay. uh, actively. Okay. They would leave that to you. So you're an adult who's come to Medina. Uh, they wouldn't really bother about your uh, a lot of, uh, you know, akhlaqiyat and your mm-hmm. suluk mm-hmm. and, you know, uh, your building as an individual within, no, that's but, they, very important. but they'll teach you. When I went to India, uh, you know, uh, what they majored on was discipline. You know, you had to sit in a way, talk in a way, eat in a way, uh, whatever else had to happen in a certain way. So for me, it was an eye opener, eye opener in the sense that, I mean, come on, you have to give credit where it lies. You can't just rule people out. Uh, You might go to uh, anywhere else. And I see small minded people, narrow minded people, people who think they're pious and religious, people who think they're very knowledgeable. Unfortunately, their akhlaq are very, very, very far from being acceptable. Yet the Prophet says, You know, the best from amongst you are those with best character. Mm -hmm. When I see any one of the the current uh, crop of uh, preachers, scholars, I just look at their akhlaq and the way they differ with others. That tells me who they are. So if they differ with others with bad words, with accusations, with, you know, you can actually say this man needs a lot of help. 
over time they may develop. We, we are not uh, employed or we're not, our job and task is not to destroy the ummah, but to build it. Do you care for those who disagree with you? Do you love those who dislike you? Do you actually reach out to those who are far away from the deen? Or are you just one who's worried about people who are within your circle? And that's it. Many people, many scholars of today are only concerned about like-minded people who are within their circle. Yeah. And I think that's a huge blunder and a big mistake. Yeah. There are billions of Muslims across the globe. You cannot just think about your own circle. Um, as, as a da'i, you have to f- worry about those who are the furthest away from the deen. In fact, those who are not on the deen, who really hate the deen. You've got to be concerned about how to reach out to them. Yeah. Very few people do that. You know, in terms of akhlaq, Mufti, I think it's a very, very important point. One of the things, uh, it reminds me of something I asked my teacher a few days ago. And I WhatsApped him and I asked him, uh, I was speaking to him in regards to whether I should study a certain book, whether I should go into it. And my teacher's response really, really, um, it amazed me, you know, and, and it made me feel grateful for having a teacher like that because I feel like they're very rare in this day and age. And you know what he said to me? He said to me, you know, all of the knowledge that you studied from before, he said, just go over that. SubhanAllah. Just go over that. Just, 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 just revise that and try and implement that. And it goes to show you how, you know, we, we hear about companions like Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu who, they they wouldn't come past an ayah of the Quran, but they would implement it and then yeah. move on. You know, they they were implementers of the deen. And do you feel like it comes down to implementation of knowledge, your akhlaq, your character, your your tarbiyah that you show people? You know, nurturing? you know, knowledge comes with a lot of arrogance when it isn't actually practiced upon in its correct way. Yeah, so when yeah, you have true. knowledge, the most arrogant people are those who have a lot of wealth and those who have a lot of knowledge when it's not checked with akhlaq. Yeah. Uh, so that's why they belittle people, they, they they call people names, they don't have value for someone, they don't see the good a person does because of one thing they may disagree with or they may not have understood or whatever, even if it's a disagreement. Uh, the way they actually cancel that person out completely, if that was the way the Prophet ﷺ taught it to us, we would have to cancel everyone because everyone is actually flawed. But subhanAllah, I agree with you. I remember when I, when I studied, you know, Sheikh, uh, one of our, my mashayikh told me that 95% of what you've studied is going to be for yourself. Only 5% you're going to be teaching others, unless you're a specialized teacher. And that's a fact because I know we've read far and wide. I don't like to brag about what I've learned. I don't like to brag about the books I know. I don't like to brag about the asanid I have. I don't like to brag about these things. But you know what? You've got to be humble. People don't want arrogance. The public will never listen to someone who comes across arrogant in any way. You have to come across as one of them who's struggling with similar challenges. Even if you're not really struggling, make them feel like, oh, look, I'm, I'm, I'm a guy just like you. We go through the same things and come on, don't worry. Inshallah, things will be fine. You know, mm. so and, and encourage people, empower people. I have a habit. I don't know if you might have picked it up. If I see people in the da'wah or in, in anything, I will encourage them to the degree that I will purposely make them feel like they are superheroes and superstars. Yeah. The reason is they are the future leaders. It's not me. I'm here temporary. I mean, I've already clocked mid 40s. I'm about to clock 50, inshallah. And to be very honest with you, uh, you know, the, the, w- we're past our sell by date. By the will of Allah, there are other people who are going to be taking on uh, the challenges of the age. When I say that, I mean technological advancement is moving in leaps and bounds. It's not going to be easy for us to keep up, you know. So, subhanAllah, to, to be able to practice what, you, what you've learned and to be able to teach it to others with the best of akhlaq, I think is very, very important. This is, a, this is something that those who are calling out towards Allah need to actually listen to. Uh, what's the point of having so much of knowledge but... Allah hasn't given you the acceptance to be able to convey that just because you haven't even thought of working on your own discipline. The condition of your heart is something I work on very, very hard to the degree that even those I dislike, you know, I don't normally get angry anymore. Mm. But but uh, recently I got very upset. Something happened. Someone said something to me at the wrong place, wrong time. Got very upset. I, I said something I'd, I regretted. I immediately apologized to the brother to say, you know what, uh, I was wrong to have said this and I shouldn't have. But we're just human. And the thing is, uh, you have to discipline yourself. You have to apologize where you've gone wrong. You have to understand that uh, my brother, my sister, if you're not going to uh, reach out to people with humbleness, they're not going to want what you have. Yeah, subhanAllah. And that's the reason why not uh, you don't have to be a graduate from somewhere to be accepted uh, as a messenger. 
Uh, yeah. to the degree of the knowledge you have. Sometimes you'll find people who are graduated have a bit of an arrogance sometimes. They think, I'm this, I have a PhD, I have an MA, I have this, and you guys don't, and who are you to talk? Uh -uh. Sometimes Allah may not accept those who have big, big degrees, you know. Um, I always tell people who, who love to talk about bid'ah that who knows, perhaps this baccalaureus is a bid'ah, perhaps the MA is a bid'ah, the doctora is a bid'ah, perhaps this, perhaps, who knows. It might fall under that according to some people's uh, interpretation of it. And... Mm. And, 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 and the fact that I have it, you have it, doesn't necessarily make you an alim and doesn't confirm that you're a jahil. You know, it's got to do with a lot more than that. Hmm. May Allah forgive us. Wallahi, hmm. you know, uh, th there is not much time, but if I were to say a lot of things, I think people would, uh, would take from it. You will always have the jealous brats, no matter who. You know, shaitan is the one who drives that. So you excuse them. You will always have people who correct you with love. You listen to them. You always have the genuine people who care for you. you. You appreciate them. But then you have the swipers. And then you have the people who target you. And then you have the people who don't know you and they think, what on earth are you doing? You have the people who think you're out there to make money or to gain fame. And that's not it. If, I, if you were to ask me about uh, how, and that was one of the things you were saying, we want to know who's behind the Instagram. Uh, how it all happened. It was just a miracle. I, 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 you know, uh, I, can, I can let you in on something very interesting. In, my, in, in one of the masjids back at home, you know, where I was the imam, also on a voluntary basis, I've never taken a penny in terms of salary for what I've done for the sake of Allah, for the deen, for teaching Islam. Not a penny. Whether when I was an imam, when I was teaching the children Alif and Ba, when I taught, when I lectured, never, not a penny. The income is absolutely separate from the work of the deen that's being done. So uh, I, I was teaching and so on. And then the same people who, who asked me to come in were the same people who started hassling and harassing. And, and at the time, I didn't know any better, but I ended up leaving and going elsewhere, went to South Africa, went to a place, did this. You know, the radio stations were involved at the time. Later on, the television stations. I got a lot of flack. I was called big, big names, going as far as Kufr, you know, at the time. And I was very young and I learned very early that you've got to ignore this. It will happen. It will keep on happening until the day you die. Yeah, yeah. True. You have to ignore it. You keep going. Wallahi, brother Musa, if my plan of my life had gone ahead, I would not have been where I am today. But because Allah blocked my plan more than 20 times, he took me to a place where I would never have dreamt I would be. Subhanallah. So when Allah blocks your plan, thank him. He's got a better plan for you. Long term. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. I think that's amazing because a lot of people, they have plans. I think a lot we of people have had, yeah. Yeah, we all have plans of what we want to do, who we want to be, the way we, the way in which we want to act, the way in which we want to dress, the person we want to marry, and the list goes on. And sometimes we find that there are blockages in those plans. True. The, there's blockages. It's just not happening. I want to go to this university. It's just not happening. You end up dropping out of university. It just doesn't. Nothing's working for you. And sometimes it's moments like that, like you mentioned, Subhanallah, that make you realize. You know what? This is what I was, you know, something that I can, it's something I'm sure many people can resonate with. The way I resonate with it is, subhanAllah, I mean, I'm someone who really struggled with my education growing up. And there was, there was a time when I wasn't even in school. And I would think to myself, you, you, you start to see the other kids and you feel a little bit left out. Like, I didn't go through that period of my life. Yes. However, if I didn't, if my father didn't take me out of school, I, I wouldn't be sitting here. I don't think I'll be sitting here. Can I tell you one thing? Uh, a piece of advice for all those who are going through blocked, uh, you know, Blockages. passages and closed doors. Please. Try your best within the capacity given to you by Allah. If it is still closed, set yourself a little deadline and move on. You have to close the door. You know, you talk about marrying people, uh, you know. Uh, at some stage, we all have had people who we mm -hmm. wanted to marry and we were blocked. If I were to tell you that I was blocked too, at a certain stage where the father told me you can go to hell. And I, I, I literally went to heaven as a result. <laughs> but alhamdulillah, yeah. the, the, you don't know what Allah is saving you from. You really yeah. don't. And people go so crazy like that's the only person on earth. And perhaps it may be for that moment. But, yeah. but in actual fact, Allah has a better plan for you. You know, And not just marriage, but let's be more serious. Sometimes you want to have a certain education. You just didn't make the grade. You tried again. You just didn't make the grade. It's Allah telling you, I want you somewhere else. But you try your best. I'm not saying don't try your best. 
Uh, once you know that you've given it your best shot, just move away. Uh, go. That's it. And Allah will take you places. Like I said, I promise you, I am today where I am because the doors were closed one after the other. Had I had doors that were open, I wouldn't even be sitting here with you today. If you ask me, had you ever dreamt that you would be in this position today? The answer is absolutely not. I had no clue. I didn't ever know. I've never pursued followers, neither on Twitter, nor on Facebook, nor on anywhere else, nor on YouTube. I, I was just myself and I kept going relentlessly with dedication, with proper uh, focus, proper focus. Nothing will take away my focus for more than a moment. When I say more than a moment, I mean sometimes you have a few, you feel, oh, I didn't expect it from this brother. There are people whom we've helped in our lives a lot. One day when they dagger you, you know, you just got to say, ah, oh, I wasn't expecting it from them. But now you learn to expect it from anyone. You know mm -hmm. what? I'm still excited. I met uh, Mufti Muhammad Munir today from America. Yeah. And I promise you, it's my first time meeting him. And one of the things I said to him is, you know, I love those who hate me. And I'm honest. The reason is, I'm just loving them for the sake of Allah, not for them. Yeah, subhanAllah. subhanAllah. And, and, and I don't need to waste a space in my heart with hatred. Even if I disagree with someone strongly, I, I love them, I care for them. I, I would love to reach out to them one day. You know, I don't have that in my heart. I actually don't. And I think sometimes what people tell me is, you know, we can hear it in the way you talk. We can see it. We know, okay, there's genuineness. But then you do have people who really dislike you with a passion for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. They won't even want to see your face. It's okay. It's fine. And it's healthy to have people who dislike you with a passion because the Prophet ﷺ had those who disliked him with a passion. So who am I? Who are you? But yeah. the thing is, you are saddened because sometimes those whom you least expected, you know. They hurt you. You know, I studied with a certain brother in Medina and uh, I saw someone uh, say things about me and uh, it's okay, it doesn't. But when I saw him confirming and saying, oh, you know, yeah, I don't know how this guy changed and I do this and that. And, and I was shocked. I actually sent him a message to say, brother, I didn't expect this from you. And you should have seen what he sent back to me. And I thanked Allah that day. And I said, oh Allah, we are human. This guy is human. He doesn't know. He hasn't even met me thereafter. He doesn't know where we work, what we do, what happens, the challenges, and so many other things. Subhanallah. Moral of the story, be determined, be focused, keep going, do it for Allah, not for anyone else. Allah will give it acceptance when he wants. And don't you think, Mufti, that it's a thing where... You know, all of us are going to be, all of us are going to face blockages, as Allah expresses to us in the Quran, uh, that this life is a test. This Correct. life, you're going to be tested. You're going to face these blockages. You're going to face these problems. But isn't it so much better to face these problems while being close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than being very, very far away from Him? I agree absolutely. And I believe that anything that brings you closer to Allah was a blessing as negative as it may have seemed to you at the time. Anything, yeah. a person dying, you losing a job, you having things uh, repossessed, whatever else it may be, losing a limb, any negativity, people attacking you, everything that brings you closer to Allah is a blessing, even if it seemed negative at the moment. Subhanallah. You know, Mufti, you're, you're a big inspiration to many people out there. And um, people, when they speak about you, um, a lot of people, they speak in a way in which I think I think some people would m might even be genuinely surprised that you might struggle with certain things or you might go through tests yourself. Yes. And there's no doubt that you're going through tests because you're a human being Absolutely. and we're all going to be tested. Absolutely, yes. So, a question is how do you manage your own tests that you may go through? Like for example, you're traveling a lot. Yes. And may that includes yourself being away from your family a lot. Yes, yes. And I I know because from a young age my father has been traveling a lot. Yes. And I've kind of had to step up at times and, you know, it, it, people don't see it. As you mentioned, people do not see it. And people from the outside, they judge, they say things. He's this, he's that. He's not real. He's a hypocrite, etc. Yes. And they just talk. How do you deal with all of these stresses? Because it can become very, it can depress a person. Yeah. If you're talking about traveling, I actually have a very disciplined routine where I try okay. and make sure that I'm at home for the maximum amount of time. Okay. And uh, my favorite, my, my pastime, you know, my free time and not only free time, I make the time for my family. I make sure that I spend time with them, uh, quality time. I leave everything and so on. So you have to prioritize. And this is the reason why it's not so easy to get me for a, for a, a trip or to get me for a talk or something. You know, uh, I have family that's spread out in a few countries, my own personal family. And subhanAllah, it's just amazing how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you the energy to actually do things when you're determined, when you really want to do things. If I were invited somewhere, I wouldn't like to spend five minutes more than I have to. I'd like to make my way back to my family. 
I wouldn't mind traveling to Malaysia for six hours and flying back immediately after the event. I really wouldn't because my family comes first and I have a family first policy. That doesn't mean Allah doesn't come first. I'm talking about the responsibilities placed on your shoulder from a social perspective. Family yeah. comes first. So Alhamdulillah, it is a challenge. We do have a lot of challenge, but I've also got the most understanding people within my family. And I thank Allah for that. I think you know some of my family uh, and so on. And Wallahi, they've been the biggest support. If it wasn't for them, I definitely acknowledge that perhaps we would have had greater obstacles yeah. in what we are doing. And we may not have achieved exactly what we have. So they share not only the reward, but a lot of our own attention and uh, much more. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. So, uh, Mufti, I'm sure as you know that uh, IERA as an organization, yes. we're a DAO organization. Yes. Alhamdulillah, we're all over the world. We focus on giving da'wah to non Muslims, sharing oh. Islam, the compassionate message of Islam. And one of the questions that I like to ask guests on, on the Rerouted podcast is what they feel like the best method of sharing Islam is. Um, what, what would you say to that? Like, what do you feel like the best, this is the best way? to show people that Islam is the way for them? Okay, uh, I can give you a, 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 a decisive answer on that. Okay. It depends on the circumstances of the people that you're trying to call towards the deen. Mostly, if your character is outshining the character of others, it's an automatic da'wah to the deen. Mm. Thereafter, you have an opportunity to break the ice and to talk to someone. When you talk to them, you know, you start off by showing them that you care. Once they know you care, the rest is done mm -hmm. you know meaning it's now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who will guide them you're going to get a chance to actually let them know share a bit of the deen and so on people come forth today people are lacking care they're lacking love from our own families Muslim families people complain my father this my mother this no love no care no this they use abusive words and so on uh, you know when you show that you're actually a person who's learned from the prophetic teachings and you're practicing it in your own homes uh, a lot of this a lot of the the scholars on the block today they have have huge issues within their own homes you know uh, and and uh, it's possible to have issues within their own homes but sometimes it, it's depicting of their character if their character is what caused it then obviously come on you know you're not if you were to ask my family about my character and conduct I'd, I'd love them to say in my absence that this guy is better than what he actually uh, portrays himself to be in the public and yeah. I promise you I think that's what they would probably say I Shana, hope so yeah that, that, that's amazing that's yeah, and I and you could. I'm I'm giving you the permission to do that behind mm -hmm. my back, and it's not like you know. And honestly speaking, I try to live by what I preach. I try very hard. I'm a human, and we do falter and we do make mistakes, but we try. And this is why, I say uh, to give dawah. For example, if you're talking to the wealthy, they don't want handouts. If you're talking to the poor, they might need handouts. You know, you got to show them you care. Yeah. Uh, you got to show them that look it's not a lot of the people who accept Islam are ostracized they they are kicked out of their homes and houses what do you do about that yeah. you know that's the thing uh, it's not just all about shahadas shahadas it's more about yeah. following up thereafter it would be worse for someone to say the shahada and to go back simply because you were not there to get them married i've yeah. come across a lot of racist families who wouldn't like their children to marry uh, a revert and when they tell me that look I, the, the, this person will never marry a revert yesterday i t this morning i was speaking to someone in the us and i said you know what i think if if abu bakr siddiq radiallahu anhu was here to marry you i don't think your father would have agreed to get you married to him because it's crazy. yeah i promise you because he did, he doesn't tick the boxes your dad once uh, ticked and wallahi it's a fact and and this is the thing and 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 uh, i have had the opportunity to speak to many parents some of them i just give it to them as it is listen you know what i don't think you would accept bilal ibn rabah if he came to propose to your daughter and yet he's from from those whose footsteps were heard in jannah Allahu Akbar. it's a fact Love. So so this is the type of thing we face. People don't want their kids to marry reverts when all the Sahaba were, were reverts. Subhanallah, you thought of that. Subhanallah, it's amazing. Yeah, I think, I think it's very, very important to think of things like that because uh, I, I just think it comes down to... I was speaking to a brother yesterday and I was explaining to him, you know, he was asking me for advice on marriage and I was explaining to him something that I've learned myself throughout my life and I think all of us we learn these things and Allah shows us these signs in our lives and, and these signs are that the solution is in Islam and I'm sure Mufti even yourself I mean you you may even agree that many of the people that actually come to you for advice they actually know what they need to do correct but but it's just 
They just need to hear it again and yeah. perhaps yeah. And it's just the act of doing it. Yes, it's you're just right. it's just doing it. And sometimes it can be hard to do it, but when you do it, you're and, and and you know that you've done the right thing, you will feel that tranquility. You will feel yourself become closer to Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's like as a father, I mean, uh, I, I'm not a father, but I'm saying as a father, I can imagine that if if a revert comes to you, maybe from a cultural perspective, you can understand why some people would say no. But however, imagine your mentality as a father, a father thinking, you know what, I'm going to do this for Allah. She wants to marry him, he wants to marry her. I don't see any problems with him, except the fact that his skin color is a little bit darker than mine. I don't see any problems with his. I'm going to accept him for the sake of Allah. Maybe just because you've done that, Allah will put barakah in our marriage. Is Absolutely. that not the way that we're supposed to think? It is the way. And if there are legitimate reasons, you can you can mention them. But if there is no legitimate reason and the, the people are ticking the boxes and there is keen interest on both sides, then I think, you know what, let it be. Hmm. I'd rather my child make something that I would consider a little mistake than to actually lose them completely. And at times, you know, we have to make sure that we do what pleases Allah always, actually. You know, if we speak about the opposite, you, you yourself as someone that people come to for advice all the time on, on these situations, have you seen that when people don't listen to this Islamic advice and then they actually do end up marrying, for example, someone from their own race that the daughter didn't want to marry, it ends up wrong? Can I tell you, I know of many, many parents, many. I, I, I'm actually in this for more than 20 years. I know of many parents who deny the daughters and the daughters grow very old and they never, ever end up marrying because no one then marries them. And sometimes I know of people who have then married, as you've said, within what pleased the parents and they were divorced. And it was a very ugly divorce, so ugly that you wouldn't imagine that Muslims would behave in a way that even the non-Muslims don't. Uh, you know, when it comes to custody of children, when it comes to yeah. uh, being civilized and when it comes to fulfilling the rights. It's 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 strange. You get to see the true colors of people when things go wrong, you know. So I, I've seen that. I've seen people quit the deen. I know of a family where they, they rejected for the, 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 the daughter to marry someone uh, that she wanted. And later on, that, that girl actually quit the deen and went away and she was gone, uh, you know, out of Islam completely. And uh, the parents, I don't know. I wonder what they must have thought and felt. But that's what happened. That's what happens when, you know, I say when you have a business, and a customer walks in, you're happy and excited because it's rizq that Allah sends. Person walks in, shows interest in your goods and commodity, it's rizq. The same way when a person comes and shows interest in your child, it's rizq from Allah. If you're going to kick it away, perhaps Allah might not give you something else. And he may give you something worse than that because you kicked it out. SubhanAllah. Every proposal that comes in, every interest in your child that comes through, uh, you know, it's fr it's Allah's rizq that's coming. You, if, if it ticks the box, you sell the goods, SubhanAllah. Allah Akbar. We would do we would do it for money and pounds, but mm. we wouldn't do it with relationships. Mm. And a lot of the time, sadly, these children sometimes are having relationships already in haram. Yeah, they're just coming to you to rubber stamp it, and you know if you're not going to do it, they're still going to keep on going in haram. I we help a lot of cases of that nature. Yeah. And what, what, the relationship with their parents is so weak that their parents don't even know what's going on. They wouldn't believe. Yeah, subhanAllah. Imagine marrying a woman who later on tells you that I never ever wanted to marry you. I was actually uh, wanting to marry someone else. I mean, that's craziness. And that type of fraud is being committed by the parents of those who don't want to see that light. I don't know what they're going to answer Allah on the day of judgment. May Allah make it easy. SubhanAllah. I mean, what about from the children's perspective, uh, Mufti? Like when, 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 let's say, for example, your father, you know that he's wise and you know he's trustworthy. And you know that your mother is the same thing. And they're not racist people. And you know that. They're not racist people. You know when they are and you know when they're not. But they're genuinely saying, this person is not good for you. Yes, yes. You shouldn't go for this. Yes. But you've done haram now. And you've caught a lot of feelings for this person. You yes. have, And you know how it goes, you know. And, and, and you just don't want to let go of this girl. Because you're going to go through pain and heartache. And you just want to marry this person. Even though deep down, you know that you should be listening to your parents. What should... A child doing that situation who's like 19, 20, 20. You see, very sadly, number one is it's a betrayal of the covenant with Allah. Number yeah. two, it's a betrayal of the parents. You know, parents have done a lot of good. They've really helped and they're being honest. Number three is it doesn't mean that you've sinned with someone that you now need to marry them. No, that's something that people need to get out of their systems. You've sinned with someone. It doesn't mean if, if, they're, if they're worth marrying, you know, and Tobas happened and so on and the marriage does occur. It's one thing. But... 
uh, it doesn't mean that you have to actually marry the, the person when you know it's a blunder and it's a mistake. We've yes. had people, I'm talking of real life, and I know some in some countries they, 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 they think it's taboo to say what I'm about to say. Uh, but we know in, we, we face these challenges. If someone is impregnated, it doesn't mean that the nikah needs to happen and so on. It, it depends who, who on earth the person is. Sometimes you've made one mistake and now you're going to go and make a much bigger mistake, you yeah. know. Yeah. So you need to seek advice, uh, yeah. matters like these. You need to find out the Islamic systems and the rules and what's the do's and the don'ts. There are a lot. Uh, but getting back to it, parents hold a very, very high value in Islam. Uh, but wherever they are unreasonable and telling you that which is in the disobedience of Allah, there is no obedience for them. Uh, and that's why if you look carefully, most of the places Allah doesn't speak about obedience of parents he speaks about being kind to them you know ihsan is a word it's goodness it's kindness uh, but uh, the, the word ta'a, ta'a, which means to follow to obey it comes where Allah says Fala so don't obey them in what when they're asking you to do something that's in association of partnership with Allah it's sinful etc Allah says in that case don't fo- don't obey them but be kind to them reach out to them talk to them uh, in, in a very respectful way, fulfill their rights. May Allah make it easy. Amen. We really, I don't want to belittle the standard and the, and the level of yeah. parents in any way. Many not. parents are suffering because of the, uh, the challenges of the globe and their children getting caught up in them. But uh, at the same time, you have parents who are also, you know, uh, worried about what the neighbor is going to say, worried about m- what my family is <laughs> going to say, worried about what the community is going to say. I know of uh, brothers who will tell their own brother, if you allow your daughter to marry that guy there, you know, you better watch out. You're, you're, you're opening the door for our daughters and they're going to trouble us and so on. So we're going to cut ties with you. So that's when the brother says, I'm not going to let this happen. And you don't, my brother, um, you're a man. You've got to, you've got to make decisions based on what Allah has taught you. Not yeah. worrying about people. Exactly, subhanAllah. And I think if you make Allah and His Messenger and what they came with the criteria for how you're going to live your life, you're going to have a peaceful life. It's very. I like to think of these things in terms of an equation. That's true, you that's know? very true. When you think of, if, if you're going to follow that, then you're going to be happy. If you're going to go against that, you're going to see, you're going to put obstacles in your way. It will catch up with you. Yeah, 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 subhanAllah. May Allah make it easy for us. Amen. I mean, so Mufti, um, one of the last things that I'd actually like to speak to you about is. From from the da'wah perspective now, yes. um, and and kind of pressing more in on that, how how do do you find that sometimes you don't even need to tell because because obviously with us alhamdulillah we we look like Muslims people they know that we are Muslims uh, do you find that sometimes you don't even need to call people to Islam because I've been at some of the events with you and some people just come up and say I just want to become a Muslim yes. you haven't said one word of that autism yeah. I want to just correct you a little bit there okay uh, uh, we always call people to Islam but you mean verbally you yeah see? no I mean di- like yes, oh, of course yes. indirectly because through the videos the fact that you're a Muslim and yeah. you identify as a Muslim just the way you move will inspire people to want to know more about Islam mm-hmm. Habibi I believe that one of the first steps is the haters who hate Islam you know to minimize that hatred is of great success in da'wah because the ultimate guidance of shahada comes from Allah in nakalata hadiman ahbabta you know you won't guide whom you love but Allah guides whom he wishes so when someone really hates Islam, if, if you relentlessly and continuously, you know, uh, prove that, you know, you're a good person and the teachings are beautiful and so on, automatically their hatred would, would diminish. The diminishing of the hatred of a hater is a great success in da'wah. A lot of people don't think of that. Secondly, when a person is close to Islam, to bring them right to the door is da'wah. That might have to happen verbally. It might have to happen, mm-hmm. but it does happen with an honesty, with so many other things. I mean, look at how uh, in, in, in Western countries, a lot of the times when there is uh, a time of need and the Muslims go out to help, there are people who come and they want to accept Islam because they never guessed that Muslims would do this. They mm-hmm. always had the wrong picture. So one uh, action from you proved to them that whatever they had in their minds was wrong and they came. And thirdly, those who are Muslims to bring them into uh, the proper fold. You know, like I was saying, when I have events, I normally like to look at it and see, uh, you know, though if, if people outwardly don't look like they're practicing, I say, oh, mashallah, you know, uh, at least we've reached a, a lovely crowd of brothers and sisters. We're not going to judge them. But, you know, perhaps uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us and them. Yeah, most definitely. And this is one of the things that I have actually developed over time. Uh, when it comes to da'wah, when it comes to the field, non-judgmental, 
completely. You never know what's going to happen. I've seen miracles. Brother Musa, we were talking about someone who was a belly dancer. Mm. And you know what? This person actually bought a ticket to one of the events, came in to say the Shahada. And the brother was telling me, you know, just a few days ago I was judging this person, thinking, oh, look at this person. And the strange thing is, Allah brings people. You wouldn't imagine. If you judge them and you... And this is why, you know, we live in, in, in the Western world. Acknowledge people, smile at them, you know, greet them. Uh, respond sometimes to that greeting when I mean, you know when I say sometimes I mean you have to respond and at the end of the day make them feel human make them feel you care I, I spoke in one of my talks yesterday and I said this raddu salam and salam is such an important thing to sal- to greet someone the Prophet Sallallahu has given it so much of importance the Quran has given it so much of importance mm-hmm. do you know primarily people lose uh, their faith because of loss of identity when you mm. greet the people around you they feel connected to you mm. there is an every day you pass someone on the train station and you greet them salam alaikum how are you and you're gone salam alaikum you're gone you know they feel connected to you they feel this i'm part of a broad family that's one of the biggest attractions of islam and the muslims is everyone supposed to be one big family shaitan's plan and plot is to split us into millions of small small groups don't let that happen we mm. might disagree I, I always give the example of frequent flyers. You know, when you join, for example, uh, a certain frequent flyer program, you start off at blue. Okay. And then you go to silver and then gold and sometimes platinum. And I always say, you know, we're sitting on maybe gold because of whatever, you know. We think we're sitting on gold. Once a person says, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, they've arrived at blue. They've, they're inside. They're already part of the frequent flyer program. You know, they're going to go to Jannah. Man qala la ilaha illallah dakhal al-Jannah. They're flying. Right. They, that's what I mean. Yeah. Now, now, now we, we actually remove them from the deen because we've got two, three differences. But they've said their shahada. They believe firmly in that shahada. We'll find reasons why we believe they don't believe in the shahada. It's so silly. That's a problem. Rather than educate them, we just took them out of the deen. You know, and we use the term al-wala wal-bara. Oh, that's a term that's being used to stop da'wah. You know, you can't sit with this guy. You can't, but I'm going there to give da'wah. I know what I'm going for. No, you can't associate. You can't even greet. You can't even respond to greeting. Well, when on earth are we going to be able to bring these people closer to us and they just don't see the light no. sometimes some of the people who've taught them that have never given dawah in the west they haven't and and this is why i've told my own mashaykh sometimes that you know what unfortunately in this matter you need to be in the west and give dawah in the west before you understand what is being asked of you because there are sometimes we ask a scholar who's never given dawah in the West about how to give dawah in the West. So they'll give us a, you know, a textbook response. But what's happening on the ground is miles apart. It just doesn't work. And this is where a lot of us are failing. We cannot apply what we've learned. We have to just you know, uh, get instruction and do whatever, even if you know it's not practical for here. You know, it's not a matter of halal haram that I'm talking about. It's a matter of uslub. A matter of approach, a matter of how much patience you have with them, a matter of how you start things and what you do, you know. Uh, when the Prophet ﷺ speaks about how to talk about, uh, uh, you know, matters of belief to begin with, la ilaha illallah, etc. Number one, yes, you will start with that when it comes to the core of da'wah. But first you need to make sure that this person is prepared to listen to, to something from you. So you've got to show them the caring that I was talking to you about. You've got to show them that you care for them, that, that you know, they, they mean a lot to you and the, their guidance would mean the world to you, subhanAllah. You know, if Allah were to guide one person through you, it's better than material items of this world. Yeah. So it's amazing. But sometimes, unfortunately, you know, we don't see the light. Some people don't yeah, see the light. SubhanAllah. I think that um, if you, if you Im- just imagine you speaking to someone like a human being giving them like that emotional intelligence that you have and speaking and they don't even know that you're a practicing muslim yet because you when you go to for example university yeah. or college you just dress like how they dress and then one day maybe they come across your instagram or something and they say wow this guy's actually he's like he's like one of those guys how is that going to affect people you know we we both know a specific brother uh who and he mentioned to me a story about regarding his wife and he said that the post lady came and his wife opened the door let her in and obviously his wife is probably in her pajamas or something like that she gives her tea etc and she said as we leave as she's leaving the house 
his wife throws on the abaya and she throws on the niqab. So not only hijab, niqab, on top of that, her, her face is covered. And the post lady is surprised. She says, I didn't know that you're, you're like one of those people. She says, yeah, this is how I dress. This is, you know, and she says, and she actually expressed to her that you've changed my perception Correct. about what I think of people who dress like you now. The problem You're human is, beings. Yes, the problem is we're taught not to interact. You know, this is what yeah, some people say. Don't yeah. interact. Don't do that. Why? How? How can that ever be correct? You must interact. Without interaction, you're not going to be able to do dawah. You like closing the door. And when it suits them, then they want to do everything. So the, the difficulties we face in, in dawah are such that, you know, my brother, Habibi, when you know you're right and you've seen something, please do it. Don't bother about those who don't see it. You know, my yeah. father's told me something that's amazing, amazing. Maybe we can end on this note. Please. He says, sometimes what you want to say or do, if you were to weigh it in kgs, might be a 10 kilo statement or action. And the brains of the people who are refuting you are only accepting 2 kilos or 5 kilos. They will never, ever understand the magnitude of where you've gone and what exactly you're trying to achieve. Because why? Yeah. They don't have the capacity to understand it. Yes. Ignore them. The minute you turn to them, you're acknowledging them. You know what? You would actually drop yourself. You know, Recently something happened and someone was saying, oh, this sheikh about me, that this sheikh said this and said that. You know, to be very honest, I was so tempted. And I said, no. Anyone who knows me knows that this is absolute drivel. It's total nonsense. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So if you know me, if you don't know me, it's fine. You don't have to. I always say Jannah is not through me. It's through following Allah and His Rasul. Even if you've been encouraged to do that through someone else, it's fine. You don't have to listen to me. Block, delete, unfollow. Follow someone else, but get yourself to Jannah. That's Allah all. Akbar. Allahu Akbar. May Allah bless you, Mufti. Jazakum Allah, Allah bless all of us. Thank you Lovely. so much. Thank Jazakallah you so much for, ha for coming on the podcast. It's been an absolute pleasure hosting you, and having you. this discussion. I mean, and you too, having the dis discussion with you. And I, and I really, really hope that, brothers and sisters, this is going to help many of you out there, inshallah. And on that note, brothers and sisters, we look forward to having you on all of the future episodes of Rerooted. Uh, I really, really hope that you have all enjoyed this episode. Make sure that you listen to it on all of the podcast platforms such as SoundCloud, Spotify, uh, Google Podcasts and Apple Podcasts as well, inshallah. Make sure you hit the subscribe button down below as well and subscribe to iera. And until the next one, take care of yourselves. It's been a pleasure. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace. Dum, 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 bam. Shum, 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 shum.